Welcome to What's New in Aerospace, sponsored by Boeing. My name is Beth Wilson. I'm a museum educator here at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. And today on the program, we are going to be talking about the very first image of a black hole. To begin, I want to introduce our guests uh, from the Phoebe Waterman House Public Observatory, uh, our astronomy educators, uh, Dr. Genevieve de Maizière and Rebecca Lundgren. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Our pleasure. So last week there was a lot of excitement around the museum because there was a very important confirmation. Uh, tell us what happened last week. Last week, for the very first time, we now have a picture of a black hole. And why is this special? I mean, black holes are part of our imagination, and people have been uh, theorizing the idea of them for hundreds of years. And we've had really strong evidence for decades that black holes exist. But until now, we have never once actually gotten to see what they really look like to, to test our theories to see if we were right. Okay, so let's take a look at this image again, and can you tell us, what are we looking at? It looks like a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> I definitely went out and got a donut at the end of the day last Wednesday, because I was so excited that we had a space donut to look at. Or maybe it looks like maybe a cat's eye or the eye of Sauron, but it really what we're seeing here is the black hole, sh uh, the shadow of its event horizon in the center, and hot gas whipping around that black hole at speeds close to the speed of light. And that is bending space time around it, causing all that stuff that's whipping around it to eventually fall inside the black hole. OK, that's kind of complex, I know. But we've, we've got a demo to demonstrate yeah. <laughs> how a black hole works. So let's get our demo up here. And those of you in the audience, you can watch on these screens. will be the best place to see this. All right. So what are we looking at here? Yeah. So here we have a piece of fabric. This fabric represents space and time. The fabric of space time is what we're all in right now. And it's all around us. It's three dimensional. Here it's 2D though, so we can do the demonstration a little bit better. Now, things that are in space and time generally have mass. That's the stuff that makes us up. We're made out of mass. This floor is made out of mass. Everything around us and things in space. So here's an example of one thing that has mass, the moon. So anything that has mass is going to interact with the fabric of space-time. So let's see what the impact of something with, without too much mass has on our model of space-time. See how it's, de it's denting space-time just a little bit. It's bending it. Everything with mass bends space, including you. You're bending space just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. The moon is bending it, not even enough, en enough for us to measure. However, we're not the biggest things in the universe, <laughs> no matter how much we want to think we are. <laughs> There's much bigger things out there, like stars, galaxies made up of stars, and at the center of some galaxies, supermassive black holes. Now, supermassive black holes are small objects that have so much mass and are so dense that they can bend space-time around them in a way that anything that gets close doesn't escape. Let's take a look at what that would look like. So I'm going to take this big object right here that's very massive, and I'm going to put it in space time, and we're going to see what happens. Whoa. What happened to it's space and time? It just got a lot heavier. Yeah. <laughs> and it just bent. Yeah. So you can see that space and time is bending towards this massive object. And if this were in three dimensions, we'd see that bending in all directions. So imagine something is traveling near this massive object, like a black hole, like a piece of light. And I'm going to try to send it your way so okay. that you can see it. Let's find out what happens. What it happened? Didn't, it didn't make it too far. Can I try it again? Yeah, sure. Oh. Almost? Nope. That no. was an interesting still. orbit. <laughs> <laughs> so it still didn't make it anywhere close to you. Because black holes and massive objects like black holes are so heavy, they have so much mass, their gravitational pull can pull everything towards them, even light itself. So from our perspective, it looks like the light gets sucked right into the black hole. Okay, which so is you why they're black. About, uh, go ahead. What? That's why they're black, because not even light can escape the event horizon of a black hole. Now, you talk about how big the, this black hole is, right? And we, the photo that we, our donut photo, photo that we have, that doesn't look very large. Well, let's take a look at it. So the photo of that black hole, and I'll take away our demonstration here. 
on that photo of a black hole that we're seeing, um, we're seeing a small black hole at the center of it called a singularity. That's where all that mass is densely packed. And it's are interacting with the space around it, and that space where it starts interacting with things is called the event horizon. So we're seeing the shadow of that event horizon right there in the center. All around it is stuff being pulled towards the black hole because of that all that gravity from its mass. It's hot gas that's been ripped off of stars and planets toward, heading towards this black hole, and it's spinning, spinning, spinning around it, and it could eventually fall into the black hole itself. How big is this? What, uh, what's the size of this? What are we looking at here, this so, black hole? Compared to us, it's huge. But compared to things that are out in the universe, not big at all. Take a look at this image. This is an approximate representation of how big this black hole might be compared to our solar system. You can see the sun in the center, Pluto's orbit around the sun, and Voyager, the, the farthest spacecraft we've ever sent away from Earth, out near the edge. So that means that the center of this black hole, that shadow, is bigger than our entire solar system and farther out than Voyager. But compared to other things in our universe, that's actually pretty small. That's pretty small? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> our solar system, but it's pretty small. Yeah. All right. Now, I get that the light bends, right? But why does it look fuzzy? Right. So, uh, like Becca was saying, that we're looking at something that's so enormously far away. And on the scale of galaxies, solar systems are really tiny. And so we're trying to see something which is stupendously far away and stupendously small. And in order to see that, even our best efforts are still yielding a fuzzy image. Now, if we were to see it from up close, we would, see, we would be able to see more detail. But being able to see it at all is an enormous accomplishment that required a global co cooperation. So can we take a look at the, the spinning? We have a video Definitely. here. So, so tell us what's going on here, because this looks sharper definitely. Than, the, than the image. If we were to be up close, um, we might get a, bit, a little higher resolution or a bigger telescope. So this is a model, a simulation done by scientists on the team of what that kind of would look like, and also from different perspectives. That black hole in the center is so massive that it bends the light around it. So what you're seeing as we change our perspective with the black hole in this video is we see that light being bent around it as well. So we'd be able to see all of those dynamics if we had a little bit better resolution, a little bit, uh, or we were closer, but we can still get all of that information from the image that was taken last week as well. Okay, so explain to us what the Event Horizon Telescope is, because I understand it's not just one. Right, so if, in, order to, um, in order to accomplish this incredible feat, in order to be able to see something so incredibly far away and very small, you need a telescope as big as the Earth, which is the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, we don't actually have a single telescope as big as the Earth. That would be really expensive, and it would probably be hard to keep working without breaking under its own weight, for example. So in order to get around that, what the Event Horizon team has done is gather together telescopes all around the world that are acting together. They are simultaneously observing black holes like the one at the center of the galaxy M87, and they're working together to effectively make a single telescope as big as the Earth with holes in it. So that means that they still have some work to do with this data in order to get, uh, to get a good image out of it. But it's basically as big as the Earth. So Genevieve, I, I want to ask you, because you spent some time with telescopes in Chile. So were they involved in this program as well? And what can you tell us about the telescopes that you saw when you were there? Right, so there are multiple telescopes around the world involved in this in places like Hawaii, uh, the United States, Europe, even Antarctica. And one of those sites was Chile. And the ALMA telescope in Chile is kind of an example of what the, how the Event Horizon Telescope works, but on a smaller scale. Because with ALMA, you have a group of radio antennas uh, on this high, dry, dark lo location in Chile that act together. When they're looking at an object at the same time, their data is put in the same place and synchronized so that they eff effectively act, act, act as a single larger telescope, which is also on a much bigger scale how the Event Horizon Telescope works. Now with Event Horizon, um, all these telescopes we've got working all at once, are they taking photos at different times? I mean, how, are, how is this working? 
Great question. They definitely need to synchronize. So these telescopes had to be taking a picture of the sky at the exact same time. Now it wasn't just a little snapshot like you take on your iPhone. This was a long observation done by these telescopes all over the world, but very synchronized at the same time. Then all of that data was collected, and it was so much data that they actually couldn't send it via email to the people they, they were collaborating with. So they actually had to take big data drives and carry those around physically to be able to then bring the data together to get this picture. Now, I'm going to ask you more about the yeah. data in a second. But what I, what I do want to know is, do you guys know how they synchronize those telescopes? How, how they synchronize yeah. those telescopes? I mean, they're definitely communicating with each okay. other and using the satellites that we have that are globally connected to be able to synchronize their watches exactly and their algorithms and everything that they're using to collect this data. Even using atomic clocks. Yes, exactly. Atomic clocks, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, now, I have some fun facts on this data, and we'll go back to that the other photo in a second. This was five petabytes of data, which would be a half a ton of hard drives 5,000 years of MP3 files, and a selfie collection for a lifetime for 40,000 people. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this photo and uh, what we're looking at here? So what we're seeing here is Katie Bowman, a member of the Event Horizon team. She's an electrical engineer and computer scientist. These discoveries take a lot more than just astronomers. You need engineers, you need data scientists, you need educators who can help people understand the, the results. You need theorists. Uh, people from all different branches need to work together in order, to, in order to, for us to understand these results. And so what she has here is all of the data from the different telescopes finally brought together in the same place. Funny note, one of the telescopes was in Antarctica, and the observation was taken in April, which is when winter was beginning there. So they couldn't bring all the data together until about seven months later when the, when the weather was OK in Antarctica to fly it out. So she's got it all together, and she led the team to write the software to uh, start putting this, to this data together so they could start making an image out of it. OK, so how do we collect this light. I mean, is there, you, you said there wasn't just one big telescope. I guess there's a reason for that? Totally. So all, there's the reason we're collecting all this data is because we're using radio telescopes. They're collecting the longest wavelength of light, and it's like collecting a rainwater. Instead of light, let's imagine it as water in a bucket. So if we had a big bucket, it would cost a lot of money and be hard to fix. That's the bucket that's the size of the Earth, right? We'd love that, but it's really hard. So instead, using these large radio telescopes spread across the world, we can make them like a lot of little buckets collecting rainwater at the same time. They're not going to collect all the rainwater, but by spreading them out, they're going to collect different types of rainwater from different areas and learn different things about the rainwater that's falling, or in this case, the light. Then when you bring all that information together, you can correlate it or layer it on top of each other to get a broader picture of the entire thing that you're looking at. In the, our analogy, it would be rain, but in this case, it's those, that radio light that we're looking at in the middle of this galaxy so far away. Can you tell us a little bit about what radio light is as opposed to like the lights we're sitting under? So when you hear radio, you think, oh, well, you turn on the car radio and you hear it, right? That's sound. But radio is actually not sound. Radio waves are a form of light. They're just much too red for our eyes to see. Our eyes only see the rainbow of light. But there's light beyond red, which is called infrared. And beyond that is, is radio. And uh, so these long wavelength uh, forms of light, these low energy kinds of light, are great ways to probe things like what's happening down in the hearts of galaxies, because that light is able to get through all that gas in between us really well. Okay, so why did we know to look at this galaxy and not another one for this black hole? Uh, so in this case, um, what, you know, that's a great question. How would we know to point this giant telescope at this one particular spot on the sky? Now, this is down in the heart of a giant galaxy called M87, an elliptical galaxy with billions of stars in it. But this galaxy has a special trick up its sleeve. What we see here is a Hubble image, but layered onto that Hubble image is a radio image showing a jet. We're going to see a close-up of the part of the galaxy that has the jet shooting out of it here. And so that jet is a narrow, focused beam of particles zipping out of the center of the galaxy, much more focused than a laser pointer and stretching about 5,000 light years in length. 
Now, what could cause these particles to be moving close to the speed of light, all in the same direction and emitting uh, light as, as they're going the way that we observe it? The only thing that theorists could think of to explain what we are observing here is a giant black hole with a swirling accretion disk around it, which is powering that jet. So we had a really good indication that there was a supermassive black hole in the center of M87. We didn't have a picture of it, but we had really good evidence of it before the event horizon looked at it. Do you want to tell us what an accretion disk is? And can, can you point it out on this image and so right. that we can Yeah, it? if we uh, look at an image of a black hole, an accretion disk can actually occur around any massive object that has stuff spinning around it. In the case of the black hole, the accretion disk that we're seeing is shining with that light of because it is hot. It's very, very hot, so much so that it's plasma. It's uh, kind of, some people call it the fourth state of matter. So it's really, really hot, and it's shining bright, and it's swirling around that black hole, spinning around it in a flat disk. So that's why we call it the accretion disk, because it accretes or gathers around it, and then it's spinning around it as well. How far away is this from us? The whole galaxy is about 54 million light years away. That means that the light we're getting from it now is 54 million years old. Is the black hole still there? Probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably. On the scale of galaxies, 55 million years isn't a very long time. For example, our solar system has been around for about 4.5 billion years. And our solar, and who knows um, what was after, before that and what will come after. So this black hole is probably still there. It might not look the same as this image that we're taking here, um, but we have pretty good evidence that it's probably still going strong. Yeah, we have a lot of people in the audience today, and I'm sure they're interested. Um, if they go outside this evening, where would they look in the sky generally to, to where this galaxy is in this black hole? So in order to find this, this galaxy, you'll have to look at the constellation Virgo. And Virgo will rise a little later tonight. So you have to wait until well after dark in order to, and in order to do this tonight. A lot of people can recognize the Big Dipper in the sky. And uh, so look for that pattern of four stars in kind of a square, and then three stars in a curved handle in the sky. That'll be your tool for finding this, this part of the, of the sky. It can, it's really useful for finding other things too. So that curved handle will arc to the bright star Arcturus, and then just keep going and spike down to the bright star Spica, which is in the constellation Virgo. That'll get you in the right part of the sky for seeing this galaxy. Okay, so black holes for a long time were a theory, and part of the theory is time travel. So will black holes allow us to travel through time? <laughs> uh, so time and space are inextricably linked. Space-time is one entity in, in our universe. And what we see when we look at the black hole is we're seeing relativistic effects, which is what you get when things are moving close to the speed of light. And all sorts of weird things that start to happen to both space and time. The way that light is bent around the black hole is very weird and very cool. And it also has effects on time. For, uh, for example, if you fell into the black hole and I was watching you and you were like shining a light back at me, uh, as you got closer and closer to the black hole, aside from being in a very hot environment with lots of radiation and all sorts of, and being in space and everything, you wouldn't actually notice anything special necessarily as you cross the event horizon. But from my point of view, I would see you move slower and slower, and your light, the light from you would get redder and redder. So it's a kind of a way of time travel when you get close to these uh, very strong gravity fields. But also people, sometimes people also talk about wormholes. Are black holes wormholes? Now, wormholes are kind of a mathematical idea, and they might exist, but we don't know yet. What I can tell when I, look at the, when I study the data from the black holes is that they get heavier over time. Like the, the, this giant one, this one, that, this one in the center of M87, it weighs more than six billion times as much as the sun. And you make a black hole when you collapse a star, but no star is that big. The only way it got that big was by swallowing other stars, gas clouds, other black holes, things like that, to get bigger over time. That mass is still there in whatever weird, twisted form we don't necessarily understand yet, but it hasn't gone anywhere else. 
Becca, what would happen if you put a human through a black hole? <laughs> we wouldn't know. We'd never get a signal back. Um, we would probably uh, never ever find out unless they found a way to get out of it or to signal back to us. But of course, we found out that nothing can escape it, even light. And the way we communicate is with light, with radio waves. So we probably wouldn't know anytime soon. Um, so unfortunately, we're probably not going to go into any black holes, um, but studying them from far can tell us a lot more about their uh, physics and their, these relativistic effects, which can then help us theorize more of these ideas in the future. I heard about sp spaghettification. Oh, yes. And so I could be really thin. Yes, <laughs> as you fall towards the black hole, from our perspective, it'll look like you've strung out into like literally your atoms, the smallest particle of you, and it'll look like you're a long line of spaghetti. So that is an actual scientific word, spaghettification. <laughs> That's, that will be a word I remember. Um, uh, why is this image so important? So. To me, uh, a big part of why it's so important is like, look at everyone who's here. We think black holes are cool. Black holes really resonate with people. It's such, they're such a weird and marvelous phenomenon that people just like them. And so getting to see an actual picture of one for the first time ever is, is, I think, just by itself, really cool. I think everyone can kind of appreciate that but it can also help us test our theories. So we have all these theories and simulations and artists' conceptions of what a black hole would look like, what's happening inside it, how does um, Einstein's relativity interact with, say, gravity and interact with quantum mechanics, but the only way to really test that is by collecting more data, for example, by taking these pictures of black holes. How many black holes are there? <laughs> um, can you think of the biggest number you've ever heard of? Multiply black times the biggest number you've ever heard of. <laughs> we don't know. So there's these supermassive black holes likely at the center of every large galaxy, like Genevia mentioned before. But there's also stellar mass black holes, ones that are the size of stars, bigger than our star, but not as big as these ones at the center of galaxies. And considering how many stars there are out there, there's probably a lot more black holes as well. So we got a f uh, question from Facebook, and they want to know what happens to light when it goes into a black hole. Great question. So nothing, we, we don't actually know what happens once something passes the event horizon. But based on our modeling and theories, we understand that light actually doesn't change its perspective. So imagine you're the piece of light and you're traveling around a black hole. From your perspective, nothing is going to change for your experience. You're still gonna be traveling the speed of light and it just so happens that the way that traveling is, it's bent in a weird way, but you're still technically traveling a straight line from your perspective. But from our perspective, it looks like the light is bending and even falling straight into the black hole. So it's a really, it's kind of trippy to think about that, um, but that's exactly what black holes are doing, bending space-time so much that it warps the perspective of those who are, are watching it. Another Facebook question, uh, are we done with the Event Horizon Telescope? Is that it? Have we this done everything we need to do now? And this is just the beginning. First of all, we'd like to take more pictures of this particular supermassive black hole. We want to see how it changes over time. Because um, on, on the scale of this black hole, as stupendously massive as it is, it's packed into such a tight volume that that material that's going around the, the black hole can actually orbit in a matter of weeks, even though it's much further out than Pluto, which takes hundreds of years to go around the sun. This stuff is really whipping around, so we might see things like flares if we keep watching. But we also want to look at other supermassive black holes, even the one at the center of our galaxy. Well, why aren't we going to get getting sucked into the black hole in the center of our galaxy? <laughs> Good question. We're, <laughs> we're kind of out in the suburbs here in our galaxy. <laughs> we're in our local arm or the Orion arm of our galaxy, which is pretty far away from our supermassive black hole at the center, which we call Sagittarius A star. You can look for the black hole at the center of our galaxy at night. It's going to be in if you see the stream of the Milky Way, if you're looking towards the constellation Sagittarius. That's the general region of the sky that you want to look in. Um, but we are very, very far away from it. So we have probably no chance um, as we know it, that we're going to get sucked into our supermassive black hole. I can't make any promises for stellar mass black holes. Okay. <laughs> um, this was part of uh, theory of relativity. Do you want to talk a little bit about Einstein and right. his relationship to black holes? So a lot of what we understand about when where space-time acts very strange comes from Einstein's theory of relativity, which uh, says that no matter whether you're going fast or slow, 
the speed of light is going to be the same from, uh, from your point of view. So say that um, you're on a train and you're going one way and I'm watching from a field and you throw a ball off the front of the train at 30 miles an hour, and if the train's going at 100 miles an hour, then you think the ball would be going at 130 miles an hour. But if you shine a flashlight, you'll see it going at light speed and I'll see it going at light speed. And all sorts of weird thing arises, all sorts of weird phenomena arise from that starting point. And that, the, that theory of relativity has been proved again and again for the last 100 years. But everyone, when they realized that the idea of a black hole might arise from that, a lot of people, including Einstein, were really uncomfortable with this idea. <laughs> the idea that basically space-time could close up around itself in this um, very strange environment was uh, very strange for a lot of the astronomers, theorists, and uh, all, all people at the time. So it took decades before people were really, really willing to accept the idea of black holes. Even Einstein tried to prove that they could not exist. But now we know they do exist. Somebody on Facebook wants to know what the relationship is between gravity and light. Is, one fa is gravity faster mm -hmm. than light? Oh, great That's question. Great question. Yeah. So uh, this, is, this is taxing my understanding here. But as far as I great know, question. when you see um, changes in gravity, for example, if you have two black holes that are spiraling in together to collide, that's going to produce a phenomenon called gravitational waves, which are ripples in that space-time fabric. Like when you have this fabric and it's shaking, um, that's, those, those ripples move out through the universe, I think, at the speed of light. So. Okay. All right, yeah. uh, so mm -hmm. what would happen if two black holes got close to each other? So we actually have, there's been other evidence of what happens potentially when two massive objects get close to each other and eventually merge. And that's exactly what Genevieve was just mentioning. We've been able to detect that with LIGO, um, which is uh, detecting those gravitational waves. When two massive objects near each other and they actually start spinning around each other, they have this angular momentum and they start spinning and spinning and eventually they might um, interact with each other and compress or collide or combine or something's happening and send those ripples out into space and create something even bigger. Yeah, we talked about how large this black hole was. In comparison to others that we theorize about, how big is this? This is a whopper. Um, so this is weighing billions of times as much as, as the sun. And in fact, uh, this image helped astronomers figure out more accurately how massive it is. Now, a, a black hole that you would make from the death of a star would may, weigh maybe a few times or maybe a few tens of times as much as a, as a star. So how do you get from that to something that weighs billions of times as much. It has devoured a lot of content over its lifetime. And over time, as it gets heavier and heavier, these black holes tend to settle toward the center of their galaxies, where they can get bigger and bigger. But some get to eat more than others. This one is feeding fast. It has an accretion disk spiraling in toward it, feeding it with plenty of new matter, so it's growing all the time. On the other hand, the, the, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, also very big, but a lot smaller than the one at the center of M87, it's only millions of times as massive as our sun. And it doesn't have much of an accretion disk that we know about. And it's not, it doesn't have a jet, and it's not devouring matter very fast, so it's growing more slowly. Yeah, we were very excited about this image. As astronomers, what's the next thing you hope to see? Why don't you start, Genevieve? Right. Uh, so this is really, you, you can call this the decade of the black hole. We're learning so much about that, and it's also a decade when, uh, when we're starting to use more ways of, of, of observing the universe than just light. We're using forms of light, we're using gravitational waves, and we're using high energy particles to explore the universe. And I, what, what I'm hoping to see next out of the Event Horizon Telescope is hopefully a picture of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, which is called Sagittarius A star, but we keep getting surprised by what comes up. I'd like to second that. I mean, we really are on the cusp of amazing science being done, not just about black holes, but about things we've never seen before. These massive projects, these international collaborations that are using radio telescopes, that are using these innovative techniques and tools to explore our universe are uncovering things we have never been able to dream of before or think of. It includes black holes, planets around other stars, the origins of our universe, all of these things I think we're going to find find more, uh, more and more about in the coming decades, and I'm really excited about it. That is all the time we have for today. I want to thank both uh, Genevieve and Becca for joining us and our sponsor, Boeing. <laughs>